Hello and welcome to this uh, YNGB webinar on weed control. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Jo Calderoy and YNGB's Operation Manager. Very soon I'll hand over to Stephen Skelton who heads up the YNGB Viticulture Working Group. Stephen will chair this webinar and also introduce our speakers. I'd just quickly like to thank our YNGB patron NP Seymour for their support with this webinar. Thank you to all those who have sent questions already. You can also ask questions during the webinar. If you go down to the bottom of your screen at the panel, you'll see a Q&A icon. Type your question here and it will just go to the panelists, not to the whole audience. However, if you want to send a chat to the whole audience, then there's also a chat icon um, next to the Q&A icon. This webinar is being recorded and it will be available on the YNGB website in a few days time. And I'll now hand over to Stephen. Thank you, Joe, And thanks very much for all your organization um, and uh, your skills with the videos and other things to come. Um, so anyway, hello everybody. Um, as Joe said, I'm uh, chair of the Viticulture Working Group. And this, is it, this, this webinar is instead of our meeting, which we were going to hold down at um, NIAB uh, East Molling. Uh, but obviously for the traveling reasons and so forth, we decided to do this webinar. So we have three speakers. Um, we have uh, Sam Barnes, who seems to disappear from my screen. Oh, no, he's there, sorry. Hi, Sam, um, who is a uh, um, viticultural consultant in his own right, but he's also technical sales representative for Seymour's, NP Seymour's, uh, one of our sponsors. So has a lot of experience in mechanical weed control. Um, We've got Julian Lacourt from NIAB East Mulling, um, who is head of wine research and viticulture, or head of viticulture and wine research there, who's been doing some interesting experiments. And finally, we have Chris Cooper from Hutchinson's, major suppliers of agrochemicals. But Chris is also the author of The Big Green Book, which is a very one of our, I would say, the most useful document that uh, YGB puts out, and is in charge of such things as getting emergency clearance for various chemicals and pesticides that we, that we need. Um, weeds, uh, I've, 45 years ago, my first day uh, working in a vineyard ever, June the 21st, 1975, I was handed a hoe taken forcibly to a very steep hill outside Rudersheim in Germany and told to get weeding with a gang of about five others. So weeding has always been sort of fore four and centre front of my viticultural experience. And I don't think it's gotten any easier, to be honest. The number of chemicals has reduced and mechanical weed control is sometimes, can sometimes be tricky. So um, we first have Julian, who is going to introduce himself and then tell us about the work he's been doing at East Marling. Julian. Thank you, Stephen. So I'm sharing with you my screen. I hope it will work. Uh, can you see my presentation? Yes. 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 Brilliant. So I'm uh, Julien Lecourt, as Stephen has said, I'm the head of viticulture and wine research at NIA BMR. So we are a research organization based, uh, at least my station is based in Kent, and we are specialized in uh, horticulture, uh, including vines now, uh, having uh, planted a research vineyard uh, a few years ago and just opened our, our research winery uh, last year. Um, Today I'm going to uh, present you some uh, results we have obtained in the frame of uh, a project called IWM Praise, which is funded by, funded by the European Union uh, for uh, three years, still three years to go. Um, and in this project, we are looking at a lot of different uh, farming systems. So arable cropping, uh, olive uh, gardens uh, and vineyards. Uh, and at Naya VMR, we are leading the work on vineyard uh, for uh, the EU uh, in this project. Um, we have uh, planted a research vineyard, uh, a section of the research vineyard at this morning. So with that comprises uh, 10 rows of Chardonnay uh, clone 96, grafted upon uh, 3309 Couder, just for this project uh, in 2018. Uh, our soil, if you've never been to our place, is Sandy Loam, it's a slight, north facing slope um, and this section of the of the vineyard which is uh, dedicated to uh, the IWM price project uh, is going to crop for the first year um, uh, for the first time this year 
um, in this project, what we are doing, we are simply um, comparing herbicides versus blade versus rollacke and versus trimming uh, as uh, ways to control uh, weeds. Uh, we are looking at different aspects of a vineyard's performance. We are, going at, we are looking at growth, so uh, canopy establishment especially, and for that we are using a tool which is called a LIDAR, which is uh, basically a laser system that allows us to assess mm. um, the size of the canopy uh, at the vineyard scale, but plant by plant. Uh, we are going to record from this year as well, yield, quality, uh, soil, uh, humidity, temperature, etc., etc. So uh, I'm going to show you now the first results we've obtained uh, uh, in the last year, basically. Um, so, so why do we why weeding in UK vineyards? Um, and when you ask, we've asked growers this question at the beginning of the project, uh, and these were the, the the answers we had to improve the microclimate in the burn zone, so to reduce humidity and, then, and therefore uh, disease pressure, to reduce as well frost risk, it does make a lot of sense. Uh, weeds uh, un growing under the row will basically pe prevent the soil from releasing heat uh, during uh, cold nights, uh, to ease the work around the vines as well, um, and to reduce competition for water and nutrients. Uh, and, and this point especially was uh, challenged by uh, a few uh, growers and, and, and advisors as well, saying that with the amount of water we receive in the UK and the quite rich soils we have uh, uh, in most of the vineyards, it shouldn't be such, a, such an issue. And, and we'll see later on that uh, we have now data proving that you need to weed to ensure or to reduce the competition uh, with your vines. And one aspect as well, which is very important, it looks good. It looks uh, tidy, and, and as a lot of our vineyards are, are used as well for uh, as a communication tool uh, to show excellence, and and there are a shop window for our wines as well. Um, this is an important aspect of, of weeding. So, I think a, a picture is sometimes better than a long speech. Uh, do we need to weed in the UK? Our first results show that yes. So. This picture speaks for itself. So that's our rows of Chardonnay uh, last year. On the left hand side, you have uh, vines which have been, uh, where in which uh, the, the weeds have been under control with herbicide. On the right, the one that has just been streamed. So the, the, they have been streamed very regularly. So that the competition wasn't you know, too high. As you can see, it's the, the weeds are still well controlled, but the competition for nutrients and water have had a tremendous effect on growth um, and you see on nutrition as well. Uh, you can see as well uh, the cover crop. We have trialed different cover crops. So you have clover here, you have uh, just the flora that, grow, that, that grows uh, um, naturally uh, at our site and then you have uh, grass and that's repeated along the row. And the results we've obtained, as you can see, have been consistent. There has been no effect of the cover crop on, uh, on the results we've obtained. Interestingly, so these are the results we've obtained. This is the leaf area on the left against uh, the different treatments we've had uh, performed in the vineyard. The first one is the herbicide, the pale blue, then you have the blade uh, cultivator, then you have the non-treated control, and then you've got the serrated disc, so the ROLAC. Um, so at flowering time, we couldn't see any difference between the different the, the vines in terms of leaf wall area, knowing that this picture has been taken late in the season, um, in, in I think it was late September, beginning of October. So at flowering, no impact yet on the, on the establishment of the canopy. However, with the same vines, same method to assess with the LIDAR, you can see that at the raison, we started to see a difference with a 20% uh, reduction in uh, leaf wall area at the raison on these vines. And this trend became, or uh, this uh, re result became more and more important. And as you can see at harvest, that's what we obtained. The difference is even larger. In terms of nutrition, we are using uh, a tool which is called the N-Tester. Uh, 
uh, you can use as well another tool which is called a DualX. Uh, there are two tools that are uh, very useful to measure directly on the leaves. It's non-destructive to measure different uh, the concentration of different uh, pigments uh, which are present in the leaves, anthocyanins, chlorophyll, and uh, flavonols. By combining uh, the, the result you obtain with these uh, uh, pigments, you can uh, calculate what is, called, what is called the nitrogen balance index, which gives you sort of an idea of the, of the nutritional status of your vines. And as you can see, the best perf performing one was herbicide uh, in, uh, which, with the highest NBA, nit nitrogen balance index, uh, NBI, sorry, nitrogen balance index, followed by the two mechanical weeders. Um, and then uh, the one that suffered the most was the non-herbicide uh, or the, just the streamed area with more than 20% reduction in NBI. Uh, what's important to note is the, the results we've obtained for the two mechanical weeders are in the normal zone. There, there is no uh, problem at all at having uh, vines of this age around 10 in terms of NBI. The, the streamed vines uh, are, you know, that are more around 7 and then they were reducing, uh, this course sorry, was reducing uh, with time and became very low towards the end of the season. Um, and this one started to suffer, as you can see on the picture. And something I wanted to, uh, you know, when you look at this picture, basically you understand very quickly that we, you have, a, or we have an issue with uh, nitrogen, uh, iron, and other minerals. Uh, and I think what's important to remember as well uh, is we've started to see the effects of um, of the wheat competition after flowering, which is quite normal. Uh, on this graph, what you have, uh, it's the nitrogen uptake rate, so milligrams of uh, nitrogen taken by day uh, along two growing seasons. It's a work that has been done in the US by Schreiner uh, and his collaborators. Uh, what you can see is the peak in uptake of nitrogen is uh, around bloom, uh, let's say it's around bloom and ends uh, at the raison. You have another one after harvest, depending on the soil temperature. Um, so the, the fact we didn't have any effect of uh, the different weeding solutions on uh, the leaf area and the NBI as well uh, before flowering or at flowering is quite normal it's because basically on young vines, um, the effect of the peak of nitrogen hasn't happened yet. Something very important as well to me uh, and that we need to bear in mind as well, it's not the case only for nitrogen and it's the case as well for potassium, phosphorus calcium, and a lot of microminerals as well taken up by the vines. The peak of uptake for potassium is between bloom and the raison, as you can see. And that's very important for one thing, being able to manage your pH. So when you have an increase um, in uh, potassium in your must, we'll have an increase as well in, um, in pH. Um, and that's very important when you think about it, because when we use mechanical weeders, you are not going on, we are not only disturbing the roots of the weeds because that's, that's, they are very principal. We are as well disturbing the roots of the vines. And the work we are carrying at the moment is to see if we can use mechanical weeders not only to control weeds, but as well to work on the timing and modify the pH of, of the must and the quality of the wine. Um, there is some work as well that has been done uh, linking malic acid with nitrogen, and that's, that's the sort of things we are, we are looking at. That's especially important uh, if you have rootstocks, which are not very good at assimilating potassium. And that's the case at this morning because we use 3 through 9 coup d'air. Sorry, it's in French. Uh, so that's potassium assimilation, good, average, low. And you have the different rootstocks here. At East Mulling, we are using uh, 3 3 9 Cuder, which is not very good at uh, taking up uh, potassium. Um, and uh, basically, I think some of the results we are obtaining, or the, the, the reaction of the vines was, was so big, it can be due to the fact that uh, this rootstock is not very good at taking up some nitrogen, some, some minerals, sorry, including potassium. It's pretty good uh, saying that for a you know, to make sure we have not over vigorous vines. So uh, these were results from last year. So what's the effect on, on this year? 
so my team went uh, early uh, earlier this week in the vineyard uh, to measure the number of efflorescences per vine. Uh, and what we see is there is no, no statistical difference between the different uh, weeders, so finger disc, uh, herbicide or blade cultivator, um, in terms of number of inflorescences per vine, that's the first crop again, uh, we had around 3.5 to 4 inflorescences per vine. But the vines that have been streamed, we call them non-treated control, because they haven't been cultivated nor uh, herbicided, have basically less, 30 to 40 percent less uh, inflorescences than the other ones. Um, that's consistent with the results we've obtained last year in terms of growth and in terms of nutrition, but it just shows how important it is to keep uh, these vines uh, weeded well, at least in our soil at this morning. So just the take home message, uh, despite very wet conditions indeed, uh, even though the last weeks you know, are proving the opposite, uh, weeding seems necessary in the UK. Um, weeding competition has proven to reduce growth, the nutritional status of the vines and the potential yield. Uh, we've seen that the mechanical weeders are effective at maintaining uh, weed pressure low and keeping the vines vigorous and healthy. Um, something we're working on at the moment a lot in, with the team is to look at timing for the, using these tools. And even though tidiness is important, that's not the priority. Uh, I think we need to be more precise in the way we are using these tools uh, on the when at least or at least working on the how deep you work with these tools to ensure the vines are well fed. Or if you uh, stream the roots, it's for a good reason, it's because you want to uh, maybe increase acidity. Um, just to give you more insight into what we are going to do uh, as extra from this year, we are going obviously to look at yield, but fruit quality as well. And we are going to um, look at the data we've obtained now for three years uh, in terms of soil temperature and humidity. Uh, and treating this data, we are going to share it on our website. So if you want more results and, and um, updates on the work we are doing, you can go on this website, which is dedicated to the project and just the work we are doing in the UK. It comprises a bit of work on arable crop, but 50% um, of it is on, 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 on vines or, or orchards. Um, and I think that's all for me. Okay, thanks very much, Julian. Um, we're going to get a chance to have some questions uh, later on, so you'll be coming back, I'm sure. So we're now going to look at the different methods of, uh, of weed control. Um, Sam's going to talk particularly about mechanical methods. Um, we're going to talk about herbicides, mulches, and then I'm going to cover a few of the alternative methods, some weird and wonderful ones, including robots and one or two other techniques. Um, I'm sure Many of you will know um, Sam uh, from his work with his own consulting business. And as I said earlier, he's also um, works for uh, NPC more and is very conversant with all the different types of uh, weed control equipment. Sam, over to you. Thank you very much, Stephen. No, that's very kind of you. Joe is um, going to be manning the screen for me and uh, moving slides on because she's got my PowerPoint presentation. But um, yeah, so here we go just coming up now um so yeah i've worked for mpc Moors for the last four years and have supplied machinery to people across the whole of the uk even into the channel islands and um the isle of wight places like that so we look at a lot of varying soil types and um people with lots of different budgets and also um different machines so and different alleyway and alleyways and growing styles um soil structures all of that kind of stuff so there's um I mean, as Julian sort of finished up in, in his presentation, the one thing that I think we, we need to take away from this is timing is most important, but you've also got to have the right tools to, um, to be able to do it with as well. Um, there is tools suitable for every budget, um, but yeah, we, we, as, we, as we go through the presentation, you'll, you'll see a few different options that, that we can provide um, and, and also some of my own opinions on, on how, how I think that those should be best used as part of a total toolkit throughout your, your entire growing season, um, be it young vines or, or established. So yeah, we can have the next slide, please, Joe. So sprayers, I think, are a great part of your total toolkit. Um, 
they're something that we've been using readily for the last 40, 50 years. Um, they're very effective. They give you a very clean result for a very little effort. And um, to be honest, I don't think we realize how lucky we are to still have them. Um, it, as part of most of my management, I would always utilize a weed spray early season and post season if I can. Um, and, and then maybe a, a shark or a cough, um, uh, a spray for broadleaf weeds and things later on through the season, which Chris will go into further. But I think this is a necessarily a necessary part of the toolkit for establishment of vines, especially. Um, and then once once you've got vines established, as as Julian's proven, you know, with with the picture, it's quite dr quite drastic. I think the the results. Um, then maybe you can move away to some other methods. Um, but spray a spray is a really important part of the the toolkit and um and yeah there's lots of different options you can you know depending on how how big a site you are if you're an acre or you've got a few rows in your garden you can get a, a micro um atomizer which you can spray neat roundup through or or a knapsack and then through to something like this system which which i you know you can cover sort of a hectare or two an hour with easily um in different row widths and it's all adjustable and, and you can set the width of the spray pattern depending on your your alleyway widths and different rates for different chemicals um so yeah really really adaptable but definitely should be part of the toolkit for something tractor mounted similar to this you're going to be looking in the price range of sort of five to six and a half thousand pounds depending on configurations and whether you want a boom for the rear of the to, to control the entire alleyway or you just want to be working at the undervine strip there's lots of different options and obviously every price um every machine has a different price point and and yeah everything can be made adaptable to your situation and the equipment you already have um yeah if we move on to the next slide please joe so something which uh i think is quite a nice tool and sort of covers two two parts is 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 a tool like the clemens multi-clean so this is a a, a strimmer head but it can also be used to remove water shoots. So it's a bit of a double-edged sword. Um, it's a bit of a jet get out of jail free card, I think, as, as Julian's um, uh, pictures have shown us, strimming doesn't necessarily give you the best results, but when things do get away, so docks, nettles, um, you know, like willow herb, things like that, this will allow you to knock that back to a ground level when, when your vine's in full leaf, which you can't do with chemicals necessarily at, at certain times in the year because of the risks of of um you know affecting your vines um so this gives you an, a nice alternative to that that will take you back down to ground level and then from there you can build up with other methods of mechanical mechanical weeding or 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 chemistry from there with a, a shark or something like that but i think it's it's a really nice tool and it, and and it could save you a lot of money on um on bud rubbing as well it's completely adaptable so it can be added into a mid mounted bracket um setup or onto a rear linkage frame or you can have it as an over row frame like was just shown in the video um prices range between five and sort of 12 grand whether you're having a single or a double sided whether you're having a complete over row system or you you, you know you're adding it to additional frame um but yeah to re realistically for all of these items you know you're going to need to get in touch with us to to work out what's going to suit your system best and also what's going to work with your current machinery um but yeah this is one part of the toolkit which i think is quite nice and um, just a bit of a get out of jail free card if, if things do get out of control. Um, if I could have the next slide, please, Joe. So as um, Julian's pointed out, the serrated disc or what we would call Braun Roll Hack, there's a lot of different brands. Clemens make one, Braun, Bar. There's, there's a lot of them on the market now. They're really, really quick and easy to use, very adaptable, working a lot of different soil types. Um, whether you're sandy, like in the picture on the left, um, you know, it looks like there's a massive ridge there, but with, with, with the way the tool works, you, you know, you will create a small ridge, but the weather will take that down because of that soil type. And that's something that needs to be taken into account when you're using these tools is you can be quite aggressive with them and, and do what you think might look bad but it's not necessarily bad building the ridge and then you can maintain it by taking it back down using the roll hack or the weather will allow it to reduce um, on really light soil. So you get sort of a soil erosion and takes it back to where it, where it's come from um, in more stony or clay soils. You may have to have a secondary implement, which I'll go into further, such as a finger weeder or, you know, I've got vineyards that are running a, ro a roll hack and a, and a 
Clemens radius SL, which is like a power hour head, which I've also got some slides of later to sort of deal deal with those those um, you know implications that come with different soil types and timings and, and things like that. But as you can see, it can be mounted mid mounted. You can have single sided or double sided front mounted. Um, you can have wider or narrower discs, um, and prices range between five and sort of twelve and a half thousand pounds, depending on the configuration that you want to go for, um, and and what what you've got what you what you do need on this is a capable tractor um we can simplify it up and go for a rear linkage mounted frame but if you want something that's mid-mounted or front mounted you're going to need quite a substantial tractor and you're going to need a, a, a decent amount of hydraulic out, output so you know for a double-sided front mounted like on the new holland you're going to need four spool valves just to operate that system which a lot of people don't have spec on their tractors to start with so um but anyway let's look at a bit of what you can do with this tool so there's a couple of videos if joe you wouldn't mind moving it on so roll hack on the left of the picture it hopefully it doesn't stall too much but basically operating speeds of this machine are between five and ten kilometers an hour you can do it in conjunction with other tools as you see here with the mower um, and it allows you to have a really quick pass i mean it's, it's by no means a herbicide but it is it's a um it's an alternative at a time of year when you can't get out there to, to use those sprays. And obviously, you know, we haven't got a lot of them left either. But um, it gives you a really nice clean result. If you're in nice friable soil like clay loams or sand or, or um, chalk and flinty sort of bra or brash or something like that, you can get some really good results really quickly. And, you know, if you've got a double sided setup, you could easily do up to a, um, up to a hectare an hour double-sided with this you know comfortably doing sort of five or six kilometers an hour and um, I think that that's quite a good result considering you know it will last for a couple of weeks um, and and uh, and does a, a fairly decent job with very very simple tools it's not it's not hydraulically driven or anything like that it's just a free running disc in the ground which is in theory just hoeing the the surface but you're not digging you don't want to go deep you don't want to take too much of that soil structure away um, and I think that's what a lot of people worry about with mechanical weeding is that you're going to disturb the soil structure and you will to an extent, but you're not destroying it because you're just working within the top sort of two inch, um, two centimeters to an inch. And you don't need to be digging a lot further than that because all of those weeds that if you're, if you're on top of them early enough, they haven't got established to the point where you can't get them out with a shallow, a shallow working tool like this. Um, if we move on to the next one, please, Joe. I think there's a yeah so that's a finished result I did this on Saturday actually in a vineyard that was weed sprayed um, with uh, Roundup back in February time I believe and um, it's quite a nice well draining site the vines are about four or five years old I've been looking after this vineyard for the last three years and that's had one pass with the rail hacks on both sides and the mower and and I think you can't really argue with the result there it looks very very clean and tidy if anything it looks a bit more um ple pleasing to the eye I think than a herbicide because you haven't got like scorched brown strips but you know it, it's going to do the job that that's required um and and you know that will be like that if we continue with the dry weather that we've got now for the next five or six weeks i wouldn't think i'll be in there again for that time either um maybe only for some of the the sort of more hardy um heavy standing weeds such as docks and thistles that might take hold on nettles i mean that, yeah they're always going to be a bit of a problem and to be honest the only way that you're going to get around a lot of those if you're going to be very particular is to go and pull them out not that a lot of you would want to hear that <laughs> but um roguing is a very effective tool but it depends whether you want to go and do it or not um yeah if i could have the next one please joe so other options as i say this is a similar tool so you've got a roll hack this is from a company called bar um, we started supplying this at MPC Moors as, a, as an alternative for people who have less hydraulic functions on their tractors and something that's a bit more suitable to, to, a, to a price point as well. Um, but within this system, we've also got finger weeders. So um, there's a double-sided double, double, -sided double disc roll hacks on the front and then behind there, the two, the two black finger weeders are, um, are running behind that to deal with, deal with the ridge a little bit. You can take one or the other off um, you don't have to use them in conjunction. You can use one or the other individually, and they and they work very effectively. But it, it's a nice it's a nice tool, and will give you a pretty solid result in a in a single pass. Um, if I can go to the next video, please, Joe, and then hopefully we can see that in action. I've got a small clip of it. 
working. So this ground's never been or hasn't been worked for about 12 months prior to this. So it's only had a weed spray at the end of end of the season previous. And um, and this is the first time in into the ground with this tool. So it's it's not something you get a, an amazing result with straight out of the box. It you know you need to build on it, and it's a maintenance tool. Um, but yeah, it'll give you a really nice result. And the finger weeder allows you to knock some of that ridge down. This this saw here is quite heavy and and tends to clump together. If you got if you got the timing wrong with the soil structure here, it can lump together, and then you'll just be moving bricks around. So you've got to do it when the soil's friable and and nice. So there's some moisture there, but not too much. Um, so you know you've really got to get your timing right, and and that's all part of you know experience, you know building on your experience and learning with your vineyard and your site and your soil. Um, but yeah, so if we can move on to the next one, please, Joe. So this is just the finger weeder on its own. Um, and it works very, very well. So for people that have, have had roll hacks historically, but have struggled to, to remove the ridge, um, we've supplied um, single mounted, this is mid mounted, but you can have it rear linkage or, or double sided. We've supplied this as a, as a quick, as a quick way of knocking that ridge down and it will drag some of those weeds around that form in a little bit of a donut around your, your um, intermediate posts and around the vine trunks, because it allows you to get right in amongst the middle there. You can do all of that with a roll hacks if you've got the right soil, but if you haven't got the right soil and you haven't got the willingness to get off the seat sometimes to adjust it to a point, um, because soil does change as you work across a field, you know, it's not always the same, but you know, there's, you can adjust a roll hack to do 99% of everything, but you, you need to get off the seat and, and play with it. And a lot of, a lot of people tend not to do that. They think they want to, you know, see a lot of soil moving. You don't have to move lots of soil, just need to move a bit. And the finger weed is a nice quick alternative that, that gets you through it. It's fast. It's very, very slow wearing. So it will last you a long time as a tool and, it, and it's very quick. But um, yeah, so that's another piece of the sort of toolkit. But um, yeah, if we could move to the next one, please, Joe. So you've got two, two options here. So Julian uses these when he was talking about the blade at, um, at EMR. These are the, the tools that he's using. Um, so it's an undercut blade. So these work really, really well around slightly more established vines. They will work around year old or two year old vines that are, are tied in with a tutor rod, but they in theory undercut the, the topsoil and, and cut the root structure of, of the weeds that are there. So if you've got hardy weeds like docks and, and nettles and thistles, these will be the tool that will you know deal with them in quite a fairly clean swoop um, and allow them to, to be cut off. Um, yeah, if we can move on, I've got a couple of videos on, on these. So you can see these vines, I think this was taken at EMR when I delivered the machine. And, um, and these vines, I think at this stage were two years old. So you can see it's just cutting, cutting the topsoil away. It's basically un unearthing everything and then just dropping it back down. And, and, and you hope that the weeds are basically going to dry out within that topsoil and then, and then be... Um, you know be left all friable when that topsoil can be incorporated again with the next pass and um yeah and and, and reduce the weed pressure as well um i think there's a couple or three videos of this to work in in different rows which joe's going to show us through um on the back of this you can see there's a small mold board as well which actually pulls the clumps away from the the back of the vine so if you you do have that what i call a donut around the vine you can actually sweep that away this is very similar to what they do in Bordeaux with like horses and plows, it, they turn it away from the vine. Um, it's, it's in theory doing the same, the same thing, but in a mechanical form with a tractor much faster. So um, yeah, and, and getting a lot closer to the vine with the, with the mechanical sense bars there. So for, the, for this system, something like the SL here, double-sided on that rear linkage mounted frame, you're gonna be looking somewhere between 15 and 20 grand, depending on what hydraulic um options you already have on the tractor the more you have the cheaper it is because you don't then need spool blocks to be able to divert oil flow to different places if you've already got it on the tractor it makes the machine cheaper um so going for a tractor like a fent with electric spools on it means you save money on the machines you buy um whereas if you have a tractor with two spool valves and they're manual and you can't adjust them then it makes it more complicated to to supply the machine and, and it makes it more expensive as well but um, yeah, that's one option. The next option that you can add to this machine, so it's exactly the same machine, if we can move on to the next one, Joe, is, um, is the rotary tiller that bolts on over the top of the blade. 
So this basically incorporates the, the topsoil and will will hoe in and it's like a small power harrow that will, will work the soil that the blade cuts up, which works really nicely amongst young vines. And if you've got a lot of build up of, um, of weeds, it will actually chop that up while, as, as you lift it. So it sort of disperses it a little bit more, gives you a little bit more of a tidy result and, um, and definitely get a, a better take throughout the season by using this. I mean, it's it's more effective, but it's more slow. So your working speeds with this would be between two and a half and five kilometers an hour if if it's your second or third pass of the season, maybe. But I mean, that's really max speed. With just the blades, you might get up to seven, eight kilometers an hour. But um, yeah, very very effective tool, and and you're definitely around going to be around the eighteen to twenty grand mark to add the this um to the to the blade so the total unit blades tillers everything all, all in is going to be a, a ballpark around the 18 to twenty thousand pound mark so they're not cheap but they're very effective um they're probably the most effective um mechanical tool that we have available to us um by far but there's a there's a price point with that obviously um if i could move to the next one please joe so the last the last option that i've got which i personally wouldn't use on maybe a lot of young vines but later on it might be something that you want to use as a as a swing wing mower um if you just want everything to look tidy and you want to reduce the amount of herbicides and and not work under vine with mechanical tools something like this will allow you to do that and as you can see in the video we'll mow very very close to posts round vines and um, at good forward speeds as well and it's a job you're already out in the vineyard doing mowing so why not stick a pair of, of swing wings on the side does a does a nice job and and very very effective something like this you're going to be looking between 10 12 grand depending on your row width um yeah and yeah it, it's, it's a good compromise and it keeps things tidy at times of year when when you know you don't want that those weeds in under vine pushing up into the into the canopy in the fruit zone so it will keep them away but i think as julian's highlighted it not possibly the best method for controlling weeds in young vines to increase vigor and, and um and uptake nutrients so um i think that that is everything that i have to say on machinery happy to chop in at any point if anyone wants me to but yeah any questions please head to our website um or, or email us at hello at mpcmore.co.uk and we'll be happy to help whether it's myself tom wheatley claire seymour or nick seymour and um yeah just give us a shout okay so, thanks sam um, sales job done um <laughs> yes thank you very much for covering all the mechanical systems no I was problem. looking earlier this today at a, 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 a New Zealand report about three vineyards that uh, converted half a block into organic and half a cop. They left half a block as sustainable over three years and yeah. just jotted down some figures. And roughly organic methods of mechanical weed control took three times as long, cost three yeah. times as much in capital as herbicides. Um, I think the joint, the, the dual herbicide sometimes, mechanical other times, because trying to herb, trying mechanical weed on soil that's already got a lot of growing weeds is quite difficult. Yeah, exactly. No, I, I so there'll agree. be plenty. Of, we've only got two questions on at the moment. Um, so any questions? We're going to. Anyone's got questions to ask? Please, uh, please type them in. Um, so Chris, we're now going to have uh, speak to you, or you're going to speak to us about the Hopefully. options or herbicides. Thank you. Right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Chris Cooper. I work for Hutchinson's, as Stephen has said. I'm part of the horticultural team. And uh, I do do the Green Book with a lot of help from others, uh, including my good old mate in Kent, Julian Spill. So together, I think we get it somewhere near right. Um, when I started, I can't match Stephen's 45 years, but I can do over 30 years. It was a very straightforward thing. You went into the vineyard, you saw the weeds there, you put on a residual in season, and you put on a contact herbicide, and that was all you did, really. Repeat if needed. Same as in. These days, <laughs> they, yeah, these days, all those in-season residuals no longer exist, and we're down to a few core contact herbicides, of which one is glyphosate, and my big fear and probably what some of this talk is predicated on is that glyphosate is under threat and might disappear or might be restricted in its use. So it will have to be a combination of uh, 
of herbicide and mechanical and, and perhaps a few of these other uh, weird and wonderful methods that uh, will be discussed later, I'm sure. But uh, Stephen's asked me to put together a, a little costing exercise and, um, and give you an idea of my, my views on the individual products involved. So if you look at uh, the costs in the second column, you see Finelsan, it's fully approved, but it costs an arm and a leg. You can only use it between May the 1st and April the 31st. It's advised that you go for an application a month which actually tots off the cost at just over £4,400 a year. And of course, you've got the earlier months and the later months when you cannot use it. Now, in fairness, my fellow fraternity hop growers, they've managed to mix it with other things and do lots of uh, adjuvants and stuff like that with it to get that cost down to £400 per hectare. But that is, it's purely a total... Um, green kill, it doesn't get into the roots like glyphosate will. So that is an option, but it's very, very expensive. Fusilade Max is really specific to grasses. Once again, it's fully approved. It won't do a great deal on cooch grass at the rate that it's approved at, and you can only use it once a year anyway. So it is there just to help out, but it's not, not that effective. Curve flow, um, once again, it's a residual, but you do have to apply it by the 31st of January. And the problem with curve flow is that uh, the weather in January isn't very, very conducive to doing field work, and a lot of you are still out there pruning anyway. And the later you apply it, um, the, the more effective it is, because it runs longer into the growing season, but it's still only gonna give you 10 to 12 weeks at most, residual control. Great on grasses, good on polygonums, but there will be a few holes in amongst that lot. I know when I was in Fronton earlier this year, they were suggesting mixing it with a adjuvant to increase the efficacy. I have tried that this year. It did seem to work, although in fairness, because of the weather, it's hardly been conducive weed growing weather. Um, well, I suppose once, in my case, from March onwards, uh, the floods disappeared, the ground got hard, and not a lot grew. However, that's, uh, that's one of those things. We did have two mils of rain today, so you never know. We'll see. Roundup I've discussed. Uh, it does show up in drinking water, potable water, so occasionally, so it does break the water framework directive occasionally which is another reason it's being looked at in terms of environmental impact, not just the, the health reasons that are well publicized with the Bayer Monsanto cases in America, but uh, it is there. Shark is, is very good. The 90 day harvest interval makes it difficult to use post flowering. It is very good at burning off suckers, water shoots, whatever you want to call them. It doesn't do anything for grasses. Um, it's ideally mixed with something like Roundup at present, and it's not too expensive. So the combination of these things can be used, but I have to say, looking forward, um, and there's a lot of vines that have been planted, I do believe that growers will have to mix and match their, their cultivations, their herbicides, and their mulching, if they do that type of thing, and try and, and get the best out of all three of those methods. So I don't think there's anything more that I can tell you than that, um, other than that I'm, I'm quite worried that if Roundup disappears, people should be in a position to use other methods to control weeds. Okay, thanks very much, Chris. Um, I'm now going to just cover some alternative methods. Um, I'm going to hopefully going to share this screen with everybody. I thought the first thing I would, so we're looking into this subject, I googled um, vineyard weeding. Um, let me just share. Can you see that? Yes, we can. Um, I've, I, you can see that. Unfortunately, Google thought I meant vineyard wedding. Um, so I... Uh, 
Mo moved on. Um, next, next slide. Sorry. So mulching. Can you see those slides? No, not coming through just yet. Not? No. Oh. I can see that. There we go. Yeah, we're away. Right. You're away? Yeah. yeah. So mulching, we tried that on a vineyard a few years ago now with using uh, PAS 100, the waste uh, compost from the, the um, green waste. Uh, very effective, good on young vines to get them going. It's got a little bit of nitrogen in it. But as a weed control solution, it's not really effective. The weeds grow through. Of course, the weeds like the nitrogen as well. And the weeds like the nice growing environment. But um, maybe for young vines, and I think one does need to distinguish between weed control on very young vines um, and what vines are slightly more established. On young vines, mulching certainly works. But it is a costly, uh, you know, the pound of vine plus. Um, that includes the material, obviously, and spreading. Um, it's not a cheap system, and you could pro probably do that three or four times in the first first two years of the vine's life if you wanted to suppress weeds using that that method. Um, this is an organic vineyard who wanted to obviously know herbicides involved and did not want to use mechanical methods in the first year. Um, you, you need to make sure your vines are very well protected, that they have a, they have a steel tutor which is firmly tied to the, the training wire because with some of the mechanical methods, uh, you do get some movement of the young vine in the soil and that you, you can uh, debate whether that's, that's a, a really a bad thing, but I, I don't like it myself. So mulching again, but you, do, you need equipment for mulching. It's not every contract can get down two meter row. These are two meter rows. Um, some of their machines are a little bit wider than that, obviously to get the bulk in the, in the machines. So you might have to buy your own machine or I know people can, there are machines you can hire but it still is quite a lot of, there's a lot of machinery involved and it takes time and it does have to be done uh, more than once a year. But it, it, with that sort of material, it can act as a, as a weed suppressant. Um, plastic mulch or what, either straightforward plastic or woven, you've got the woven on the left, the so-called Mipex, uh, and then the plastic, obviously these are, these are not in vineyards, but uh, my first five and a half acres of vines that I planted, I used the uh, black polythene, um, some of which deteriorates in the sunshine in the first year. So you need to make sure it's the right um, quality in terms of content of carbon black. You have got this edge problem. Of course, you have to keep the edges free of weeds. You can't mow the, right up to the edge. On a small scale, you can strim, but even so, strimming can destroy the, um, uh, the plastic. So you do need to work out how you're gonna keep the, the grass and, and weeds down along the, along the edges because they will quite quickly creep over the, um, the plastic. But for a small area, uh, um, for amateurs and for small, very small vineyards, I would say that mulching is an alternative because you can mow or, or, or carefully strim the edges. Um, so a couple of uh, slightly more uh, traditional methods. One traditional with horses. I don't think we yet have any horses plowing in, in vineyards, but it can't be far, lo far off. On the right, you see the Palenk power assisted hand hoe, which I've not, not seen used, but uh, I hear people tell me that it does work. So again, on a small scale, hand hoeing with electrical power hoe might be something to consider. Um, people often talk about sheep in vineyards. I've actually done that myself, but one of the problems is that uh, you have to pen them up quite closely. So you need to have electric fencing, which you can move. The public don't, like, don't always like electric fencing when they touch it. So you need to make sure the public don't get near it. Um, the sheep need to be pretty hard grazed um, in order for them to sort of get down to the, uh, get, the get the weeds away. And of course they will start on the, on the vines, a little bit of deleafing maybe, but it's not a perfect solution for summer weeding. For winter, it's a different matter. Other ways, well, I don't think we've got any of these in the UK, but if you Google weeder geese, you will find weeder geese. Uh, fancy for selling those, Sam? Um, and they will apparently keep the weeds down. But again, as you can see, high stem vines, so um, you can pen them up in there and they're not too much of a problem. Right, Yeelands Estate, quite famous for using pigs, but this is, again, this is not for, for uh, summer weed growth, but in the winter. Um, I think we're getting down to the sort of uh, strange, weird and wonderful now, llamas, armadillos, all these things come up when you Google vineyard weeding. 
kangaroos even apparently but they do like grapes um one thing which i think hasn't quite got to the stage where it's practical and where it's um cost effective though is hot foam hot steam hot water um my local council uh, uses hot water along the the curbs and it, it works for a few weeks but they soon they soon grow back again but i believe that if the price of the foam came down that might be an effective way of um of keeping the weeds under control um but as yet i don't believe that any i don't think anyone uses it in the uk um lastly robots again if you i mean i had i knew there were robots and i knew they've been around for weeding for mowing but uh, i had not realized quite how many they were there are literally dozens of them there's some big companies going into it there's some weird and, weird and wonderful companies going into it most of these do more than just just mow. the two little ones really just do mow mowing and they can be set off and they will they will can be left to their own devices eminently stealable i would think so i'm not sure they can be used in every situation the larger ones more difficult to steal um, and uh, they seem to do a good job if you look at the videos but they are horrendously expensive and they work quite slowly um, and i think they're really only for the much larger uh, much larger vineyards one of our problems in the UK is we have much wetter soils than they do um, overseas. And I think that is one of, the, one of the problems that we have to face up to. Okay, that's, uh, that's, how do I do this? Stop share. Okay. Um, We've got so we've questions. got, yeah, yeah. Hello, we've got. Some, if you'd like to, everyone like to unmute themselves. Julian, are you, you hiding? You still there? Yeah, no worries. Um, so we've got a few questions here. I'll just take them from the top at the moment. Uh, Julian, how significant is mowing the alleyways in between the rows? Um, Depending on the weather, how much it rains, uh, your soil type, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. Yeah. How long is the string is the answer. Um, I, I think uh, what's important to bear in mind again is why do you mow? It's like why do you weed? Uh, you know, if it's to keep it tidy, then it's, you know people mow very low as well. We tend at this point to mow quite high, um, and and we are perfectly happy with the result. So you may hear the baby crying. Oh. Um. Obviously, cultivating in the middle of the row is an option. Sam, have you? Uh, how many people would you say cultivate? I mean, for in the first perhaps one or two years, I know people do that, but as a as a long term solution, especially yeah. when you get a year harvest like two thousand and nineteen, I wouldn't want to have cultivated alleyways. No, I mean you you can do every other, but I think cover cropping maybe is an option there to to get you know to have a cultivate early season and then you choose the weeds that you you plant in theory and you can also have some benefits from them and mulch them onto the onto the herbicide strip and, and then that gets incorporated. Um, yeah, I think I only know of one vineyard that runs a complete like open soil structure or two actually. I think Power and Hope do. Um, they, does, they, yeah. and then cover crop every other and, yeah. and, and, um, and that works well but his soil type towards that because there's a lot of flint in it so it drains very easily and you can yeah. you can access it whereas if you were to go down to where I live in the Weald of Kent it, you would yeah if you made that that mess right. out there you'd never get out of it. <laughs> so um, yeah it, it courses for courses and it's been yard dependent and whilst yeah. you're talking about I mean green manuring I've tried green manuring in the past and uh, you find that for the first two years the plants you planted come through but then they soon get dominated by grass and within three or four years you're, you're back to a, a grass sword really yeah I I think that, that links very well with a, a question we have in the chat not in the q and a uh if you look at it uh which is why don't we use cover crop under the row and i think you've just answered the question that's something we've tried already at this morning uh the problem you have is in a year basically the cover crop has been replaced by uh, the natural flora and grass, etc., that will grow back. Um, and then talking about uh, cover crops and you know all, all the questions James Snowden is asking, I think we need to bear in mind as well that a vineyard, even when we cultivate under the row, 
the vast majority of the vineyard isn't cultivated as we, we still keep the cover crop in the entire room. If you look at the vineyard from the sky, especially from the large rows we've got uh, in the UK, you know, I wouldn't see it as something that's destroying the environment as you are, as you are claiming. Uh, again, we need to do more research on that. That's something we are looking at this morning in the project I've shown you. Uh, we are going to look at soil compaction, but as well microbial activity under the row and in the inter row. And that's the very reason of the different cover crops we've sown as well uh, in the inter row. Yeah, my experience of using, I try cover crops on a, on a patch and the, the, for maybe for a year or so, uh, the vines will, will be okay, but they soon start, they, they then start to struggle. And you can see that they're, they're being negatively affected by the cover crop. Cover crops right up to the vine, in my experience, don't work. We have, um, you can never tell what the year is going to be like. And if you had a year like this year, very dry year, uh, the vines would definitely suffer. Yeah. Um, so I'm sorry, James, that's the answer to your question. But thanks and for the question anyway. Regarding mycorrhizae as well, I think there are multiple re answers to that. First, um, you know, if you look at studies that have been published, you just type it on Google Scholar, you will see that uh, not all the mycorrhiza are good for grapes. So it's not the love story we are always told about. Uh, some mycorrhiza strains are detrimental to the performance of the crop. Of the crop. Um, and that's, I think, very interesting. And the, the roots of the vines are going to colonize not only uh, their row, but the entire row as well with time. And therefore, we'll have access to some mycorrhiza over there. So again, I wouldn't be too worried about that. Yeah, OK. A uh, question for Sam, is there a, um, a small holder strimmer somewhere between a handheld one and a full-on motorized one? Um, it depends if you've got a tractor of sorts. I mean, are you talking that you've got a lawnmower and you want to do something or, you, or do you have like a Massey Ferguson 135? Do you, Let's do you... assume they have some sort of tractor. Yeah, um, unless you've got hydraulic flow, it's, it's yeah, really, it's not going to happen. You're going to be just with a hand strimmer. So you need to have a tractor with not a lot of hydraulic flow, 20 litres a minute. So like a Massey 135 that's, you know, twice the age of me is going to it's going to cope with that. But um, yeah, you, you know, you don't have to spend mad money. Can you retrofit hydraulics to pretty well any tractor? Uh, yeah, but as long as, but not like a lawnmower. If it's a hydrostatic oh, no, tractor... Then, yeah, but yeah. you'd be amazed. There's, you know, there's it's not people... like a ride-on mower, no. But you mean a, yeah, something that's got a three-point catalyst tractor, something. With, yeah, with three-point hitch and and, a, and yeah. a bit of oil flow, you could make that work for sure. Okay, yeah. thank you, um, Chris. Roundup replacement. What's the feeling? I mean, just I asked you this question before, but I'd like you. To, how, what percentage of fruit crops in the UK is uh, is control weed control with herbicides? Uh, over 90%, including, well, if we're talking top fruit rather than soft fruit, but over 90% of the um, top fruit is controlled. With apples, herbicides. apples, pears, cherries, plums, etc. Yeah. Yeah. Nine, nine zero percent. So what nine are they going to do when, when round, let's assume Roundup comes under increasing issues, problems. What are, what are those 90% of growers going to be using, do you think? Well, does the AHDB work looking at that flamethrower um, type weeding um, rig that uh, because it was so wet last year, all the batteries fused when it was tight, so that wasn't so clever, but it is being developed, so that was interesting. Oh, um, I didn't hear that. Well, they, all the batteries? The, the, well, I'm told all the batteries sort of, uh, because it was so wet and the, the weeds were so wet, they shorted out. <laughs> right. Yes. So, uh, but, but it's being developed. Um, what are they going to do? The short answer is, I don't know. It hasn't gone yet, but um, they still can use things like hormone weed killers. So they've got that option. They've also got higher rates of fusel aid, things like that. So um, they're not in such a, an awkward position as we are. Do we not have hormones at the right time of the year in vineyards no. for spot treatment? No. 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 I know there's a question well, about... Well, you do, sorry, sorry, you do in nursery stock, but if you use them at the wrong time of the year, you kill your vines. So, yeah, on no, cropping, yeah, yeah. We've had a question about docks and brambles and nettles. So, out of season, out in the dormant period, you, there are material, there are herbicides that will attack those. Not unless you've got a 365-day harvest interval. 365-day? Harvest interval. Right, okay. 
you back to roguing, Stephen. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, a thistle spudder. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Alan Chubb has given us some. Alan Chubb, who's an organic grower, a um, long standing, talking about a mix of legumes, clover, and creeping buttercup that overrides more vigorous weeds. I suspect that's as a as a, a growing mulch to, to weed control. Um, so there are people who are using mulches, um, crop, cover crops for weed control. Um, Julian, there was a question about your, um, your studies. These are obviously quite young vines. Do you think once those, uh, had those younger vines been given a fair chance for two to three years and then the cover crop allowed to, to grow up or the, the, the weeds allowed to grow up to them, do you think they might have fared a little bit better? We are going to continue like that for five years. Uh, there is another question regarding, uh, did we measure the root system? Uh, French, uh, French yeah. Uh, trappy. Uh, that's something we are going to do in the last year, looking at the root system as it's destructive. We are going to grab these plants and look at uh, the impact of the different treatments on the root system. Uh, and then what's going to happen beyond this project is open to discussion, really. And I think what uh, the, we, we may start, start to look at other things as well. Uh, yeah. I, I must say that we are using mechanical readers for uh, three years almost now, Sam. Uh, only yeah. in the yard, we are not using herbicides anymore, uh, and the combination using the combination of the blade and the rollac uh, is very, um, you know, gives a very satisfa satisfactory result to us. So we are very happy with that at the moment. One one question which I I have about mechanical weed weeders is the is the hydraulic arm, the the arm that touches the vine or the post. Um, mm -hmm. When I started studying viticulture in, as I said, in the, you know, the seventies. Um, there were very, there were, I think, I don't think there were any hydraulically operated weeders, but there were some sprung loaded weeders, uh, and they got a bad name because they, their action arm whacked the vine on the same place every time, going one way or going the other. Do you think there's any, we have a question here about do mechanical weeders encourage water shoots? Do you think mechanical weeders, because they are striking the vine pretty much at the same, the, the, the activator arm, or whatever you call that, striking the vine at pretty much the same position each time it's used. Do you think that might lead to any problems, water shoots or trunk diseases or lesions? I don't, I don't think so. They're all, they've come a long way. I mean, Clemens, I think they launched their first um, un, um, radius blade back in the 80s. There, there was, they, they shared a picture a little while ago and it, it's archaic looking thing, but very effective. And um, hydraulic, yeah, uh, I, yeah, that's hydraulic with the sensor bar exactly the same as they are now. So, the old ones used to rely on hydraulic pressure to react the blade, so you would have to rely on the resistance to fold the blade back. The, the way the system works now, it's an electronic sensor, so the resistance is much lighter. And right. as you can see in those videos that I showed earlier, th those vines are only a year old clipped to a vine tutor, and there's no flex in them at all, it's very, very gentle. Um, and I, yeah, I don't think that you'll see any issues with it, especially if you're not, as long as you're not always running down every row the same way and to use mechanical tools effectively, you need to be turning your root on its head. So one time you're working one row and then you work it the other way the next time, because otherwise if you always drive the vineyard in exactly the same route, you'll always miss the same weeds. Whereas if you turn it on its head, yeah. then you have a second bite at the, at the weeds, which you wouldn't have if you kept doing it the same way. Yeah. There are one or two. We are, using, we are using the blade from your one in our vineyard, not a problem at all. As soon as you know how to set up your machine well, you're fine. As, as Sam was saying, it's, it's very sensitive as a, the, the trigger is very sensitive and, and hasn't created any issue, but you need to set your, mach, to set your machine, to, set, to do the setup of your machine well, and, and, when, and assess along your vineyard. And when you have changes, changes in soil type, uh, changing maybe your setup, that's very important to, to uh, to work on on, on the machines uh, along your, your day. That's very important. And having having GPS planted vines as well helps because you pretty much guarantee the rows are right the right exactly the right width. Yeah. Um, hand planted rows sometimes diverge towards each other. Um, Sam, there's one or two things. There's I've I've seen in some vineyards a, a machine a, a sort of a strimmer using which uses sort of uh, it's back sort of 
bands of material which 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 knocks off the um, water shoots but also has some effect on the weeds themselves have yeah, you yeah. experienced of those yeah so that's like the clemens multi-clean that i put the small video on earlier yeah but there's, there's a different few, few different variants now so you can have like that is a is like a polymer and then you have the born one is a rubber finger so it wears slower but there, there's some new strimmer heads coming through at the moment which top fruit seem to be picking up a little bit but my, the, 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 the only argument that I sort of have against all of this is the carbon footprint of it. And everyone can bash herbicides as much as they like, but you're only going to do one or two passes a season. Whereas with mechanical weeds, your, your mechanical weeding, you're going to do more passes. And in theory, your, mecha your carbon footprint is much greater. And with these strimmer type systems where you're relying on actual strimmer cable, what's happening to all that microplastic. We're all very big on what's in the ocean and plastics being left everywhere. Well, are you just filling your vineyard with lots of little bits of plastic? Yeah. You know, over time it's gonna wear and wear and wear. Whereas cultivation, yes, okay, you might destroy some soil structure, but as long as you're only working very shallow, realistically nothing's living in that or no, nothing like the, your worms and all of that kind of stuff to where the vines need it is it, much deeper. Those weeds, you're, it, you know, it's a sacrificial surface layer, in my opinion, and I think Julian would kind of agree with me. And, and that's where herbicide works nicely as well. I mean, Matt's got a question here about glyphosate concerning soil health. And I mean, that would have to be something that I'd pass over to Chris and Julian for some science on that. But I mean, yeah, you're, you're not having to upturn everything. You're leaving everything intact with herbicides, aren't you? So, you know, I think it's a quite a nice clean option. Yeah. I mean, the glyphosate argument is about is about health of the operators and users, isn't it? Rather than than the detrimental to the soil. Yeah. Well, and and I think there's a, an argument about bacteria, soil bacteria and things like that. But I, I mean, I don't think you can find many people that you have used Roundup readily for the last forty years that would be wanting to see it go. I mean, my father would be one of them, and I think every other fruit farmer in in the whole of the UK would have probably mixed a lot of tanks of it without PPE thirty years ago. And you know, they're not, you know, they're not not all right. So, you know. Yeah, yes, I think the issue the issue with this is that um, a lot of these Roundup, Shark, and um, Curb are all under threat because they've got to be re re um, submitted for approval. And every time that something goes in for a resubmission, the approval changes slightly generally. Yeah. I mean, it is something that supermarkets have got hold of, and the pressure is coming from both ends, really, from the marketing end. Um, and from the sort of uh, the, the um, authorities end, the certification end. Um, Julian, did you measure root growth on these vines? Is there any way you can measure root growth apart from digging a vine up? Yeah, there, there are ways. There are tools uh, we could use. That's not in the in the frame of the of the project at the moment, but that's something we may do later on. Uh, the view we've taken is at the moment what we want, uh, we, are, we are waiting for years to accumulate before looking at that because, you know, just looking at it as a snapshot wouldn't be so informative in effect. Vines may adapt uh, and the results I've shown you may change, you know, in the next years. Um, so we shall see. There, there, there has been quite a lot of research done, done abroad on, on exactly what we've done basically uh, in, this, in this trial. Um, and they show that after four to five years, vines do um, sort of recover or adapt, but that's the case in much drier regions where the cover crop dies uh, and the weeds die as well uh, in the season. That's not the case at all. Um, the, the weather is not helping for that, um, no. in the UK. Okay, thank you very much. You're not thinking of establishing a glass walled trench, are you, like you have with the, root, the apple root stocks? You know, you know what? I'm thinking of it. <laughs> Yeah, it would be interesting. Would be interesting. And, and looking at different rootstocks as well would be very interesting. Yeah. Um, uh, there's a question about um, subsoiling. Is it recommended to subsoil every other? I'm not sure what this has got to do with weed control, but we'll ask it. Recommended to subsoil every other row each year to relieve compaction. Uh, is it is it recommended to subsoil every other year? Some soil. Some, and some yeah. soils need it. Some soils don't. Yeah, exactly. Um, and also how heavy heavy you are in the vineyard. 
you know how how many passes you're doing if you're doing more passes because of mechanical weeding etc then yes i would say you probably need to be doing something to rectify that but I, like I out there doing curb in january you know you're going to be putting more pressure down on wetter potential soil so yeah this question of compaction at, at I think is one rather in, in the mind rather than actual actuality because uh, we think if the more you drive, the more more compaction you cause, but that isn't actually the case, is it? Um, and there are now tractors with uh, with with tracks on them, which obviously don't have much uh, comp compaction at all. Um, if sheep are if sheep as weed control is a viable option, uh, does this preclude the, preclude the spraying of all fungicides? Um, do you have to be fully organic to use livestock? Well, I don't think copper and sulfur is probably very nice for a sheep to to eat. Um, is there any regulations, you know, Chris, on sheep in recently sprayed vineyards? I've not come across any. I have to say that we haven't got um, many products that have got a re-entry period for humans. So most of that's to do with contact with the grow uh, with the um, operator. So. I've not come across any. I wouldn't think the fungicides that are generally used would hurt sheep. But, uh, no. There you are. Right. <clears throat> okay, I think we're getting to all. Anybody got any more questions? How many people we got on? We only got, we've got, still got 74 participants. I've, you're, you're hanging on in there. We're hey. almost at the end. Um, so I think, Joe, are you there? I am here. Yes, I yeah. am still here. Well, yes. I, I, think, I think we have sort of got pretty much to the end of the questions. We got pretty much the end of the time. I think it's been a fascinating hour and a quarter. I think we've covered pretty well every option available to growers in this country to control weeds. Timing, I, I had a phone call yesterday from somebody who planted weeds, uh, pl sorry, planted weeds, planted a vineyard, asking me what did I think was the best method of weed control. I said, and I sort of said to myself, have you only just started thinking about this? Well, the vines have been in the ground four weeks. Um, yeah, you need to think about weed control a lot longer than four weeks after you've planted, earlier than four weeks after you've planted. Um, luckily, the area is small, so I said go and buy a knapsack um, as a first line of defence. Okay, thank you very I see much. see that uh, Andrew Monsey has popped up that copper is toxic to sheep, so avoid the copper. Well, that's uh, organic growers, beware. Yes. Okay, I, right. think I think we're done. Jo, so, okay, I would just say um, before I close the webinar, I'd just like to thank everybody um, for attending, all our participants. Um, Stephen, thank you for chairing, and also thank you to our panelists, Julian, Sam, and Chris. I will send out a survey. It's great to have the feedback, and it helps me to organize future webinars. Um, this is being recorded and will be available in a few days' time on the YNGB. Um, website and we are planning for two weeks time another webinar which will focus on pests and diseases so thank you again and goodbye to everybody thank you very much right. yeah good, good evening night. to you all yeah all right.